So, apparently I found out just recently they didn't even put what I was going to be talking about on the um, information. So, um, he told me to talk about whatever I wanted, so uh, I had planned this a while back. <clears throat> By any chance, were any of you guys in New York when I did the presentation a couple months ago? Probably not. Okay, so, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I've been working on this game for about a year, and I really haven't, I've been kind of tight-lipped about it on the, um, on the channel, but... Uh, I, uh, I'm getting really close to being done, so I thought I would go ahead and, and reveal it and talk about some of the challenges that were that I had to deal with in, in putting a game like this on the Commodore 64, which would probably apply to pretty much any of the 8-bit systems. And a lot of people are often asking about, you know, what are the challenges to get, uh, you know, write modern games for these older computers. So that's what I'm going to talk about. So I hope all y'all find it interesting. <laughs> so. Um, just so you'll know, this game is really close to completion, probably like 98%. I've been working on it for a year. I've even got uh, the boxes are getting manufactured. And I've got a prototype here that the box company sent me, and you're in luck because this arrived just you know, a few days ago. Um, I haven't got the whole you know, thousand boxes in yet, but I've got one. So um, I'm going to be out at the autograph booth later, so if anybody wants to you know, take a look at this. I've also got a prototype manual and a floppy disk in there, so y'all can look at that. Um, so anyway, um, I'll go ahead and start talking about what, uh, what this is about. Now when I set off to create this game, um, this is not the game by the way, this is, this is StarCraft. And uh, I had this picture here for anybody who was not familiar with StarCraft, it's, uh, which hopefully all of you guys are, but uh, you know, I wanted to create something that felt kind of like this for the Commodore 64, which to my knowledge has never been done before. And uh, so I've been thinking about this for several years, and one of the challenges, the first challenge before even coding it was just trying to figure out a way to make the game playable because um, these types of games are designed uh, to be mouse controlled. And while well, yes, you can get a mouse on a Commodore 64, it's, they're pretty rare and I wouldn't really want to target uh, having a mouse because most of the people who own them don't have them. So I wanted to be able to create um, a keyboard controlled game. Uh, the other problem was uh, when you have mouse control and you can grab a bunch of different characters at once and move them around, one of the things that requires is what's called pathfinding. So every different unit that you can control has to be able to find its own way around. And I also knew that I was not going to have enough RAM to allow individual pathfinding for units. So I knew you were going to have to drive each individual unit uh, manually. And so again, that would kind of preclude the whole mouse control thing anyway. So that's part of what I had to end up doing is, is figuring out a new user interface for a real-time strategy game. So uh, some of my original goals was um, I wanted to have long gameplay. Uh, it seems like a lot of, not only the older games, but a lot of the newer games that people are writing for vintage systems just tend to be recreations of arcade games and, and things like that. And, and, and I just, I feel like, you know, how many times can a person play Galaga or a clone of Galaga or Pac-Man without getting bored, you know? And I see some of these newer games that come out and I'm like, yeah, I mean, that was probably a lot of work to code that. But I'll play it for four or five minutes, and I'm like, well, you know, that's about all the gameplay there is on that. So I wanted to create something that people would get, you know, at least a few hours of entertainment out of uh, when they, if they were to uh, purchase the game. Um, I originally wanted to fit on a cartridge. That was kind of one of my goals. Because a lot of these people, they'll buy the Commodore 64s on eBay, and um, they don't have a working disk drive, and... You know, I thought, wouldn't it be great if I could put it on a cartridge and then you could just stick it in. All you would need is the computer and a TV, you know. That would be kind of like a game console. Unfortunately, as the game progressed, I realized that wasn't going to be financially feasible simply from the perspective that a cartridge game for the C64 can only hold 16K. And they do make bank switching cartridges that you can fit more on, but the price of that goes up a lot, and I did a lot of polls asking what people thought would be an appropriate price for a modern game like this for a vintage system, and um, I, I think that 25 to 30 bucks seemed to be the general consensus of what I was looking for, and a, a cartridge game would have pushed it up like 60, 70 bucks probably, so I decided to just um, keep it on floppy disk. But as a concession, I said, okay, well, if I'm gonna put it on a floppy disk, I want to make absolutely sure that once the game is done loading, there's no more loading. Because uh, any of you guys that have ever played the old games on floppy disk, one of the things that 
drove me crazy, even back then, uh, was that, like, take Ultima, it's like you'd move five paces over and it'd be like, oh, please insert disc number three, side B, and you'd have to reach over and swap it around. That was a pain, and I don't think most modern gamers are willing to tolerate that. So I, I figured, well, at minimum, we can get it all in memory, and then that way the game just keeps playing the whole time without having to access the disc drive. And I did succeed with that. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about um, some of the choices I had to make. And, and while these choices are specific to the Commodore 64, you'll find a lot of the same dilemmas with any of the older game systems that you might be looking at, whether it be the Ataris or even Nintendo or something like that. You're going to have to choose how you want to do the graphics, and each mode has a certain set of compromises. And so I thought about this quite a bit uh, before I started work. And obviously you could use standard character mode. It only takes 1K of screen RAM. But you pretty much are stuck using just the characters, the 256 characters uh, that come in ROM. That's not really what I wanted. Uh, the other option was uh, you could redefine the character set, which uses essentially the same mode, but um, it does take up a little more RAM. You needed uh, at least two kilobytes of RAM to store the, the new character set. Um, there's a multicolor character mode, which takes up the same amount of RAM. Uh, the disadvantages, uh, or the, the advantages, you get to use four colors per character, but um, you get half the resolution, so that makes things pretty blocky. And uh, then, of course, uh, bitmap graphics mode is what a lot of the you know better looking games are, are written in, but that takes an additional 8K of screen RAM, uh, screen RAM plus an additional 1K of color, color RAM, plus you're going to have to have some space just to actually store the graphics and the background that you're, you know, to call them up to put them on the screen. So that's going to take a lot. And remember, we're dealing with a 64K RAM system, and I knew this game was going to be extremely RAM um, hungry. And uh, then there's a multicolor graphics mode as well, and it uses essentially the same amount of memory, but you get half resolution. And, well, what I ended up going with was a redefined character mode. So, and that was to save RAM, because uh, I just simply could not spare the additional 9K for uh, any of the bitmap graphics modes. So, I'm telling you before I even show you this game that the graphics are not going to blow you away. They're pretty plain, but I was concentrating mostly on gameplay, and so, like I said, I needed the RAM for that. This is an example of a program that I wrote um, to help me design the graphics, and I called it Tile Draw. And it doesn't actually even say, and this is just a screenshot, so I can't actually manipulate it here, but um, it's a 16 pixel by 16 pixel graphic you can draw. And because this is character mode, what you're essentially looking at is that tree, that's a, that's a tree, <laughs> you can tell. And it's actually four characters. Um, and each character can have one color plus the background color, which is, is black in my game. So even though my tiles that I'm designing this stuff with can have four colors, I can't really put the colors anywhere I want. I, there's a dividing line, and the tree, for example, I designed it specifically to try to take advantage of where that dividing line was, so I could put the green part at the top and the brown part at the bottom. And that's just an example of how difficult it was to design the graphics for this game, because everything I drew had to be designed around this four-character tile. And, and so, uh, like I said, the, it's essentially a monochrome image. And uh, this, uh, all these numbers over here on the side, uh, I actually designed this program so that uh, it doesn't actually save these graphics, it just tells me uh, the hexade uh, hexadecimal numbers so that I can plug it right into my source code so that um, I can uh, program the graphics in there. Here's another example, this is a tank. And uh, I think I've got a, that's an explosion. And again, you can see how I'm trying to design it so that the, uh, you know, it lines up with the, the different color boundaries that, that I have to deal with there. Uh, this is water. And uh, the reason I designed it with a little preview there of it tiled together like that is because some tiles, like water, for example, need to kind of match up with itself on the other side. And so that way I have two different previews. So this is a screenshot. I'll actually show you the real game here in a minute. But this is just a screenshot of what the actual game looks like. And uh, I borrowed a lot of um, the layout of the screen from some of the... Um, turn-based strategy games that, like Ultima, Times of Lore, things like that, that, uh, that we used to play back in the 80s. So there's a, a definite look to, uh, you know, an Ultima look to the game. But it doesn't play anything like Ultima. It plays uh, a little bit more like StarCraft would. 
And um, so uh, I'm just going to show you um, how I designed the keyboard interface for this. Uh, so here's your, your Commodore 64 keyboard. So I designed it so that uh, you could really only control up to 10 different movable, drivable units, whether it be tanks or builders or whatever. And uh, that actually worked out pretty well. In fact, I've found that playing the game, I really usually only have more than five or six uh, at a time anyway. So 10 is actually fine. And you can switch between them uh, using those keys. And of course, you can build up to 54 buildings. Um, and you can switch between those, just cycle through them using the plus and minus key. And uh, you can move around with the cursor keys, and some people hate that, so I also added uh, the ASDW. I experimented with joystick control, but I actually found it to be more cumbersome than it's worth because you need to use the keyboard so much uh, to control some of the other features. The joystick just seemed to get in the way, so I just, I just took it out. Um, the return is for browse, which I'll show you what that does later. And then uh, the function keys control all of the different features of all the different buildings and units and stuff that you're operating. Um, the Commodore 64 doesn't have an escape key, but it does have this weird little back arrow that's never used for anything. I decided to make that my escape key. <laughs> M toggles the music on and off, and run stop will pause or exit the game. So, now I want to talk a little bit about memory. And memory was, and still is, the biggest challenge in writing this game. Believe it or not, it wasn't CPU power, it wasn't graphics, but memory was the number one limiting factor for me as I try to develop this game. So the Commodore 64 is well known for having 64K of memory. However, um, it's not, not all of the memory is equal in how it works. So the first, six t uh, first two banks of the 64's memory are 16K banks of RAM. They're free, except for that little reserved area. In fact, that first bank, I have listed 16, but there's really only about 14K available for free. That little reserved area is handled, uh, is some of the zero page stuff, and it's handled screen memory and stuff like that. It's handled by the kernel. So that's off limits. Um, the next bank is for cartridge. And here's where things start to get tricky. This 6502 processor can only access 64K of memory, and that includes ROM and RAM and I.O. space. So you might start to ask, well, how do you have 64K of RAM plus all that other stuff? Well, the trick is you can't use it all at the same time. And so as an example, this bank here can be a cartridge or it can be RAM. Now, if there's no cartridge plugged in the computer, then it's RAM. This next uh, bank is basic, um, or cartridge, or RAM, depending upon how you're using it. Um, the next bank is actually always RAM, 4K. This is the I.O. space. Now, what that means uh, is all of the chips in the computer, the video chip, the sound chip, the chip that reads the keyboard, the joystick ports, communicates with the disk drive, everything Everything that's input and output on the computer is accessed like memory. Basically, the CPU reads and writes to it just like memory addresses. That's how the, the CPU communicates with those chips. So this space is dedicated for, for that purpose. And if it can also be RAM. But if you turn it off, or if you turn that mode to RAM, it's almost like cutting the head off the computer, because then you can't, can't communicate with anything anymore. So your program is essentially headless. Um, the last bank is kernel ROM or RAM. Now, I need the kernel running in my game because I need to access the disk drive, I need to read the keyboard, a lot of little housekeeping things that the kernel does. So that kind of has to stay there. In fact, if you ever look at the startup screen on the Commodore 64, it should look familiar to a lot of you. One of the things that a lot of people used to ask about, even back in the day, they'll say, well, it says 64K RAM system, but <laughs> Oops, you might not want to. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so it says 64K RAM system, but why does it only say 38911 basic bytes free? There should be 64K free, right? Well, the reason goes back to um, this arrangement here, and that the basic needs contiguous RAM. So, for the 38911 basic bytes free, they're using it's those first two. Um, memory banks and then the uh, 8K next to it. And so that's what BASIC uses. And yeah, so even Commodore didn't want to mess with using the higher memory. It was too much of a pain. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, so here's how I ended up doing things. I put my game code in the first bank. And um, so I get about 14K just for the, the code, which is not a lot. 
Uh, the map, this is where it stores everything, all the trees, all the water, all the grass, all the dirt, whatever. All that information about the map, it takes up 24K and it goes in those two banks. The next area I used for the um, unit data, and what I mean by that is um, every unit that you have, whether it be a building, an enemy unit, one of your player units, you have to have a certain amount of RAM, actually it's about 12 bytes that each one gets, and it just maintains information like where is it on the map, what's its location, what's it doing, what kind of unit it is, what tile should be represent that unit, that type of thing. And then the uh, actual screens, like the intro screen and some of the other stuff, actually that was originally a lot bigger. I had to write a compression routine to get that to fit in 4K. So I've actually got four different screens. They all fit in there. The music and sound effects is combined into this little 4K section there. And I had to skimp out quite a bit on the music and sound effects. I know a lot of uh, C64 games, they'll use 8, sometimes 16K just for the, the music. So. Um, I didn't get a lot of space for that, so um, that was another sacrifice there. And uh, believe it or not, uh, I was able to get the screen RAM to occupy the same space as the kernel RAM. And uh, this is actually a really good thing because I, I actually got stuck at one point and I just had run out of RAM. And a friend of mine had told me, he says, well, why don't you move the screen RAM up into the kernel RAM section? And I said, well, I have to have the kernel. And he says, well, the good news is the way the memory management unit works in the Commodore 64 is if you ever make a write to an area that's occupied by ROM, the computer knows, hey, that's ROM. There's no reason to try to write to ROM. You can't write to ROM. So go ahead and send that write to RAM. And the video chip, if you move its screen RAM location over to, well, wherever you move it to, it ignores any RAM because, again, it knows it's not reading video memory from ROM. So the good news is if you move the video screen RAM area up to that area, you can write to it as long as you don't need to read to it, read from it. You can write to it all day long and the video chip is happy to display it. So hey, that ended up freeing up uh, some extra uh, RAM for me by moving it up there into the kernel space. So uh, anyway, enough on that. I don't suppose anybody has any questions up to this point, do they? <laughs> yes, sir. Did you cross a boundary if you needed to? Like, you know if you needed more RAM for something else, could it go into another area or were you stuck with Well, it? yeah, it just depends. It's, it's kind of hard. I mean, it's not impossible, but yeah, there's a lot of challenges in, in, in that kind of thing. Um, all right, so uh, here's some things that I wanted to have in the game that had to get cut out because I started running out of RAM. Originally, I was going to have, and this is just a term I came up with, a living map. I wanted it to be kind of like SimCity where like, if you blew something up, and there were some trees. The trees would catch on fire and the fire would spread, burn down the whole forest. And, or if there was some area where there was an explosion and the grass was all burned, that the grass would go back, uh, grow back over time. And you know, um, just a lot of little things like that where the map kind of evolved on its own. And to be honest, I actually had part of it working for a while. And there was plenty of CPU power left over for that, but the, the routines themselves were already pushing 6K and I figured it'd be another 6K before they were done, and so I just had to take them out just to make room for the rest of the game. So there's still a little bit of stuff left over from that, um, but um, I also originally wanted to have boats and flying units and a lot of other stuff, and, and there just wasn't enough RAM, so I ended up having to cut those out. And um, I also wanted to have like a little mini-map, and well, like in StarCraft or other games like that, you've got a little mini map down at the bottom. Now, I didn't have enough screen real estate for that, but I wanted to have like a key you could push that would take you to another screen and show you like where you are on the map. Um, but uh, in order to do that, the, the map is 256 tiles wide. The only way you could represent that, even if you only had one pixel to represent each tile, you'd still need 256 pixels. The only way to be able to do that is initialize graphics mode. And, there, there just wasn't any way to initialize graphics mode because I didn't have any leftover screen RAM. So that had to get cut out. I also wanted to have some additional music. And I don't know it, how many of you are familiar with Anders Jensen. He wrote a lot of the music for this game. And I was really uh, disappointed I wasn't able to put more of it in there. But as a consolation, uh, he came up with this idea that he was going to... He was going to take all the extra music that he wrote and put them on a cassette, and the cassette's going to be in the box. Um, so, uh, and, 
What's also kind of interesting about this, I had told him that I might be making an MS-DOS version of this game, and he, I said I might be, like maybe next year, and he got really carried away, so he rewrote all the music for both AdLib and uh, Roland MT32. <laughs> so I told him just to go ahead and stick it on the tape, so the game doesn't even exist. I haven't written a single line of code for that, but if it does, uh, it's already got music written for it, and that'll be on the tape too. <laughs> And, uh, and, when I, and when this goes on sale, uh, when people buy it from my website, not only will you get sent the box, but you'll also get a digital download of this tape as well as the game itself for emulator play and, and whatnot, or if you wanted to put it on an SD card or something like that. So uh, yeah, and this is the, um, uh, these actually are in manufacturing right now. I should have these next week. It was unfortunate I didn't get one in time to bring here. Uh, this is the, uh, like the, the jewel case insert, so you can see like, what that looks like, and this is the inside of the jewel case insert. So, um, a lot of people ask, you know, hey, I want to create a game for a vintage system. How long does it take? So, I thought I would give you my experience uh, since I'm nearly done with this. And how long different aspects of this has taken? Keep in mind, um, I've done pretty much the vast majority of the work here. Uh, Anders Jensen did the music, and he also designed the box. Uh, I had to write all the text, but he designed all the, the box art for me. So, um, believe it or not, I only spent about 25% of my time actually coding for this game. And um, probably about that much on graphics. <laughs> it would have probably been more than that if I were using like a true bitmap graphics mode, because then I would have had to make fancier graphics. But since I couldn't, that's what I did. Same with the music and sound routines, uh, just, just figuring out what to do for that. Spent about that much time there. Testing. So yeah, every time I add a feature, I have to go in and play the game. And one of the things that's getting really time consuming now that the game is getting further along is that, like in the beginning of the game, I could test something like really quick. Like, oh, I just made this change, let me open the game. Okay, yep, yep, that worked. Like if just like a screen drawing routine or something like that. But now that I'm dealing more with the logic of the game, <laughs> every time like, oh, I need to change the behavior of this alien when he does this or that. Well, in order to test that, now I've got to start the game up and play it for 15 minutes just to see if the alien behaves the way I want him to behave. And so that becomes extremely time consuming. Um, it's a pity I don't have like a you know, horde of beta testers out there like a true game company would have that would do that for me. <laughs> uh, so yeah, testing actually requires uh, quite a bit of time. Um, writing the user manual, believe it or not, is no small feat. In fact, I have a copy of the user manual here that y'all can look at later if y'all come by my booth. And just uh, handling the box and the materials manufacturing, you know, I have to go out and get these contracts with these manufacturers to make the box and make the, um, the manual, get it printed, and uh, just disc labels, and there's just a lot of little logistical stuff like that that uh, takes more time than I anticipated. So, uh, yeah, and like I said, I've been working on this for about a year, and I probably spent an hour or two a day working on it, so just to give people an idea of what it really takes. And, and now, although yes, I'm gonna sell this, <laughs> and I'm anticipating sales somewhere between 500 and 1,000 copies, which is not really a lot for you know, like any kind of modern system. And the sad part is I calculated up how much money I'm gonna make, and it's actually less than minimum wage when you, <laughs> when you actually like look at the amount of hours that I've spent doing it. So it definitely, if you ever decide to do something like this, it's, it's gotta be something you really want to do as a hobby. And then if you happen to get paid for it, then, Consider yourself lucky, I guess. <laughs> so there's definitely not a lot of money involved in, uh, in uh, making these uh, types of games. So uh, let's see what's next on my uh, spreadsheet here. Oh yeah, so a lot of people have asked me, well, if the game's successful, you know, what, uh, what might you port it to beyond the Commodore 64? And uh, now, these are not planned, by the way. I'm just, uh, I thought, well, these are systems that would be I guess relatively easy to port them to, mo mostly because um, all of these systems run 6502 code, and this is all written in 6502 assembly. So if I wanted to port it to the Nintendo, for example, all of the logic of the game, would the source code would essentially port right over. Now, the only things that would have to change would be all the routines handling the graphics and sound and some of the memory management and stuff, because that's different on the Nintendo. But yeah, all these systems would be a relatively easy port. When I say easy, it might only take me two months to port it. Uh, but a lot of people want MS-DOS or Amiga. And of course, these systems run completely different processors. And so what that means is start all from scratch. 
completely. Uh, I could not spare even a single bit of code. However, um, I have already kind of decided that um, if people like this game, I, I think I will. I spent all of 2017 doing the C64 version, so all of 2018 maybe uh, doing the MS-DOS version. But we'll, we'll see if people like it or not first. So uh, yeah, here's what the uh, box looks like. Um, sorry, these are in portrait. I was kind of in a hurry. Uh, that's the back of the box. Like I said, y'all can look at this later at my booth. And uh, there's the, the manual. And uh, these are some of the maps. And uh, in fact, I probably should play the game first before I show you these. But uh, <laughs> these are just some of the different maps. And these are in the manual, too, of the, some of the different worlds that you can play. And uh, so that's it on that. Um, I guess the next thing I'll do is actually start up the game. How much time have we got left? Yeah, I'm just going to play just a few minutes of this, just so that you guys can see what this is like. Um, let's see. Is that the simulator? Yeah. Yeah, obviously I've been designing and testing most of I do keep a real machine at home to test this on, but I, I do most of my testing in the emulator. What that emulator is on? That is Vice. Not this simulator, but there's a, another one that can. All right. Okay, this is the intro. Now, um, you can select um, different maps. I'm going to go ahead and just play the, uh, whoops, the default map. And then uh, you can also select uh, different difficulty levels. So I'll go ahead and start the game. It has to load the map. Okay, so it starts off fairly simple. There's uh, not a lot to see here. Of course, just most real-time strategy games don't start you off with a lot. So um, first thing it gives you is a factory and a builder. Now, uh, this builder guy, now if you look in the uh, options section, uh, every unit I select, that's that's what uh, what things this, this can do. Now, um, I was... I'm going to show you what the browse does. So if you want to move to another unit, and if you can see that unit on the screen, you can just press uh, return, and it'll pop up this little thing here, and you can just move around, and I can go to the factory. Uh, the factory can do a few different things. I can go to this guy over here. And um, so the first thing you're going to need to do is, uh, like with most real-time strategy games, is you're going to need to um, um, collect minerals. Actually, I'm going to restart this game. Somehow I picked hard mode. Um, and the reason I don't want to do that is because uh, it starts me off with zero uh, resources. Casual. And so uh, uh, this is the end game screen, by the way. Not a lot to see here since not a lot happened. Um, so yeah, let's pick, uh, I'm just going to pick easy this time. So. Uh, so yeah, I got a lot of resources now, so that way I won't have to wait so long to show you what some of this stuff does. So um, now, you, originally, of course, what you need to do is find some resources, and I, even though I don't need them right now, I'm going to show you uh, what they do. So like, here's a, a resource deposit. Now, you can actually mine any of these things, but the blue crystals, yes, that's kind of taken from StarCraft, um, are the most potent uh, minerals that you can get. So if you can find those, those are the ones you want. So you can carry those back to your... Uh, factory and uh, if you don't get lost there it is and you drop that down there and then you can go over to your factory tell it you want to process those it'll start working and it'll take it a while and well you would actually see the minerals increasing but 255 is the maximum so you actually won't see that <laughs> um, I'm going to go over here and build another factory that's something you're going to need is lots of factories in other buildings so that guy will start doing his little uh, job he'll uh, bulldoze first and he'll come back and lay stuff. Now this is a fully multitasking game so you can switch over to um, you know another unit and go off and do your own thing and, and he'll keep... Uh, yeah I actually kind of had to create almost like a multitasking kernel uh, to handle up to 128 processes which on the Commodore 64 is a little bit challenging. Um, so yeah he's, uh, he's done there with, uh, with that. So uh, let me show you some of the other stuff you can make. 
Um, you would need to create solar panels to create energy. And while he's doing that, I'm going to take this other guy down here. Now, this is some lava, and here's some gas vents. So you would need to build gas refineries on these to harvest. Now, of course, normally you're going to have to go around and look for this stuff. I just happen to know where all this stuff is because I've played it like 40 billion times. Uh, so, okay, so you have a solar panel there, and the solar panel will automatically start adding to your energy reserve. Um, so another thing you can build is a research building. And I'll let that get started on that. Okay, he's already finished his uh, refinery. Normally I'd go ahead and cap these other uh, ones as well, but we won't do that for the moment. I'm going to have him build a missile silo. Oh, and then I'll tell you what, we'll go up here and build a tank. Now this is uh, your one and only offensive unit. I originally wanted to have several more, but like I said, I ran out of RAM. So uh, the tank, um, he can shoot things, uh, you know, like whatever. He can shoot the enemy. You can shoot your own stuff if you want. I kill my own guy down here if I want to. Uh, the tank also has another unique ability. Um, it uh, has a self-destruct mode. There's a little bit of a time delay on it, like it has to build up its reactor. And, It'll blow up, and uh, if you get, you know, if you can get that into the middle of the enemy base, um, then yeah, you can take out, take out quite a bit with that. So, okay, missile silo is done. So uh, this, if you happen to know, if you have found your enemy, um, then you can uh, target him by, uh, you can, uh, you know, just pick the coordinates you want it to go, and then you can build a missile. You have to wait a little while for that to build. Um, in the meantime, I will take you down and show you the enemy base. Now, because we're playing the easy level right now, the, there won't be a lot there. Because he doesn't build much on the easy level. But uh, There's actually three enemy bases on this level, but uh, this is the closest one. Okay, so that's his base. And he's got a little alien guy uh, that comes out of this base. Now, right now, I actually have it set to where he only creates one. In fact, I don't know where he is. He should be... God is learning. <laughs> um, you know, I think I think I started an old. I think this. Uh, I think this is an older copy. Um, yeah, I've got a newer copy on here too. But uh, yeah, where I've been working on his AI routine. Yeah, the enemy uh, and this. I think in this version, he just wanders the map. He actually in the latest version, he comes to your base, but he doesn't actually attack you yet. That's that's basically the the last thing I have to finish is the uh, AI routine for the enemy. Um, well, obviously his uh, little sentry pods work. Now again, on the easy level, he only builds two of these. So uh, yeah, on the harder levels, they're like a whole circle around. In fact, I'll show you that in, in just a minute. I want to go back to the uh, missile silo. So, yeah, uh, in fact, I'm going to show you how this missile works. So I'm going to adjust the coordinates to where it'll land right next to the silo. Let's see, 39, oops. Okay, and then uh, Y is going to be 51. So okay, and I'll go ahead and uh, see. You see it's armed because I've already armed it, so I'm just going to launch that missile. And uh, that's all it does. So if you know where the enemy is, uh, then, you, you know. Now you can't normally build these missile silos right away. Um, I've actually got it set that way just for testing. But normally, uh, see, I've gone down here to my uh, little research building. Uh, normally, you would need to research all of these things before you'd be able to build them. But they, so anyway, I'm going to show you a game that I've got saved um, that's in a little bit more of an advanced state. So this is what a base might look like after you've been playing for a while. I built a you know a wall around it, um, and uh, to help keep the you know there's my solar panels, and uh, there's my uh, refineries. Uh, this guy has like I said a lot more uh, <laughs> uh, things to attack you with. And uh, one of the other challenges in this game is uh, geographical. Each map has a set of geographical challenges to overcome. The particular map we're playing right now, the geographical challenge is, uh, and yeah, I built that road. 
uh, is to get across the river. And so you actually have to build a bridge. It's kind of time consuming because you have to build it one piece at a time and each piece does cost resources. And so yeah, I had to build a bridge across this river. And um, like I said, there's more bases on the other side. Um, yeah, so you'd have to attack all those. So uh, anyway, um, looks like I'm about running out of time. Um, so yeah, when you exit the game, or when you win the game, or lose the game, or in this case exit, it will um, it'll uh, take you here. Oh, and there is in-game music, by the way. Um, I'll show it to you. Uh, it's I just I have it turned off by default because there's only three voices on the SID chip, and my music takes three voices. So I just decided, well, you know, you can toggle between sound effects or music, and so. Um, <laughs> so uh, anyway, it looks like I'm. Um, <laughs> some people have probably heard that music before because I did it on my 8-bit keys channel. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, anyway, it looks like. So it looks like I have a few minutes for questions. So. Um, uh, and obviously you guys are welcome to come to, to my booth and ask me questions. I'll be out there for a while too. So, uh, yes sir? Well, now that you've rebuilt the game and you're thinking about doing a DOS port, would you be um, considering documenting that DOS port through videos and things like that, showing us your process? And, you know, yeah, in fact, doing some live streams of testing? I, mean, I thought about doing videos on this and believe it or not, it, it, it was kind of an internal struggle because I, I got the game so far and I thought, well, maybe I should do a video on it. And then I thought, no, people won't understand what the game's about yet, so let me do a few more features. And then I'd get those features done and they're like, well, maybe just a few more features. And, and now I've got to the point I'm almost done, so might as well <laughs> release it now. But yeah, with the MS-DOS port, yeah, I'd probably give a little bit more frequent updates. Yes, sir. Were you tempted at any point to stick the message, you have not enough minerals into the game? <laughs> Actually, it has that message. Uh, it doesn't, it, it just displays it down in the little text box, though, and it actually, and then it'll tell you how many you needed. I should have shown you that. Uh, but yeah, if you run out, it, it will it will tell you that. <laughs> any more questions? Yes, sir. Um, the demo scene uh, from Belgium and Europe, where you try to make the biggest, like, graphical right. game with a small amount of RAM, are you a part of that at all? No. I, I'm familiar with it, but no, I'm, I'm not a part of it. I'm actually not. <laughs> yes, sir. So um, when you were doing the coding, how much of that time was spent trying to get around technical hurdles, and how much of it was spent um, actually just writing code that you knew what you were doing? Um, most of the technical hurdles, I this type of things that just keeps me up at night thinking about it. Uh, so I think I, I, I planned pretty well for the technical hurdles, but I did spend a lot of time hunting bugs. You know, bug hunting on these uh, types of computers is pretty difficult sometimes because uh, sometimes it's a piece of code not even related to what you're working on that's causing the problem, and, and sometimes it's really hard to figure out where the problems are coming from. So yeah, troubleshooting is probably at least 50% of the coding. Like the debugger in Visual Studio. <laughs> no. Uh, yes, sir. So um, you talked about your challenges and um, you know testing, but how long did it take you to make the game fun and like you know challenging enough for somebody you know so that they they, they they you know they go back to play it more? Well, that remains to be seen if it's fun. So uh, <laughs> I don't I don't really have a good answer. Okay. <laughs> I'll have to wait till some other people have played it. Yes, sir. Do you uh, hide any Easter eggs that are worth looking for? You know, I wanted to. I really wanted to, but because of my RAM limitations, and by the way, I, I meant to mention this, so um, I'm not actually done with the game yet. I'm still working on the AI routines, and I have less than one kilobyte left to finish the AI routines. And so um, if I have any space left over, then maybe I'll put some kind of Easter egg, but I just I don't think there's going to be any. <laughs> uh, yes, sir? Okay. Uh, if you were designing your Oh wow! Uh, I, there's so much I could say about that. I couldn't even begin to answer that question right now. Um, however, if you watch my channel, uh, you're going to be seeing something that might answer a lot of your questions in a couple of weeks. So, <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> because I'm going to be showing a homebrew uh, 6502 based computer in a couple of weeks, and I'm going to be talking a lot about that. So, all right. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, in the Atari panel, they were talking a lot about the art on the box conveying, they had to convey, like, sometimes the story through the box art. Mm -hmm. And then with this game, are you going to have any lore in the manual, or are you just going to kind of leave that up to our own imagination of why we're attacking? Oh, the no, actually, there, there's a little bit on that. Uh, in fact, it says right here, you're in charge of a colonization of this planet, which has a suitable climate for humans. However, the planet is also claimed by neighboring alien species called the Protoids. They are also attempting to colonize the planet. Your job is to destroy the enemy bases to clear away for future Earth colony ships. So, yeah, there's still a little bit more to that. I won't read it all, but... Yeah, so there's a little bit of that. <laughs> yes, sir. Do you have any special assembly tools or just text editor and assembler? I use a text editor and I use the Acme cross compiler and then I test in Vice. So, yeah, that's the only tools I really use. Um, so, uh, yes, sir, Robin. So, if you do do a DOS port, would you implement some features that you want to put? Absolutely. In fact, that's one of the reasons I want to do the DOS port is because even if I target the older DOS machines, you can still expect to have 640K, which is 10 times the amount of memory that I had on the C64. So I, I'm pretty sure I can get most of those features that I wanted. Plus, the graphics would look better. Um, I'd have more music, uh, more room for music, more uh, different types of units. Uh, absolutely. That, that would be one of the great things about doing the DOS port. Uh, yes, sir. With everything you do, you keep yourself pretty busy, and uh, I'm sure you face a little bit of frustration with uh, trying to program this game. What do you find, what, what keeps you going? What, is, what, what helps kind of give that motivation to keep going and, you know, yeah, I'm going to finish this? I guess I just think it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, it's certain, I'm not, certainly not in it for the money. Not, not, the, not the game, anyway. <laughs> All right, there's a lot of hands up. Uh, you over the court. Um, if you do that, it's not well, that's a good question. I've been asking a lot of people their opinions on that. They're in the know, and I do know x86 Assembler, although I haven't used it in like 20 years. So, yeah, I'm not sure. I, that's write, it, write it in, in 86 Assembler. <laughs> I, th I mean, I think at least bits of it would be. Even if I wrote it in like C, I would probably add a lot of procedures that are, are assembly routines. But I don't know the whole game. In assembly, no, I'm not. I'm not sure. Okay, so uh, I don't know how much time I got left. So, uh, who's who's next? Any questions? You in the back with the uh, curly hair. Either one. Either one. Just in just as a hobby, but I did learn it when I was 14. So. Um, I guess I'm on the C64 anyway, so I got a lot of got a lot of years of practice on that. <laughs> so uh, yeah, yeah, you're back there. Yeah, so I, I had a brief question about uh, tray allocation. Mm -hmm. You've got um, you have the two blocks with the kernel, and you have the little one over in the uh, next to the first bank of memory, and then there's the last section that you partially overwrote. And mm -hmm. Uh, you mean like what the kernel does? No, I mean, uh, it seemed like both of them had the kernel in it. No, uh, just one was input-output space, and the other one was the actual, the 8K one was the kernel. Uh, that, that little sliver on your, on your graphic, it was on the far left of the screen. Oh, 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 yes. Oh, no, that was actually uh, screen RAM, uh, which I actually ended up moving, but by default, that's what it's used for. But then there's a zero-page memory and a lot of just... Stuff and yeah, that's that's where the kernel stores a lot of its variables, like like RAM and stuff like that. It's not very much, but it's a, it's a little bit. So I don't know if I've got any time left. Somebody will just have to shut me up, I guess. Time's up. All right. Well, if all y'all got any questions, they're gonna stick me out in the autograph booth up in the front somewhere. And uh, I know a lot of you already came to see me, but if you have any questions, you can ask me there. And you, if you want to come see the box. Uh,